Good evening everyone. Thanks for coming in uh, after a busy work day. Uh, my name is Roshan. Uh, I currently work at Informatica and uh, today we are going to talk about SaaS. Uh, so a little bit uh, background about myself. Uh, so I have been working on SaaS and cloud for quite some time. Uh, starting with Microsoft. I was part of the Microsoft online team and then I worked at Rackspace. I don't know how many of you have heard of Rackspace. Yeah, they, so I was part of their public cloud. And then I joined VMware and at VMware uh, I worked on the team which was involved with moving VMware into a SaaS company. So you know VMware has been selling software for forever but it is making a very concerted bid to uh, offer more and more services uh, uh, on in a, by the SaaS model. Currently at Informatica, uh, I don't know how many of you know, Informatica is a leader in data management. It has been doing selling data management software for almost 20 years, again on-prem software. But over the last three to four years, it has make, made a huge transition to offering the same functionality, but now offer it as a fully deployed SaaS uh, platform offering. All right, so apps as a service. So for, let's forget about software, right? You, we are moving in a, we are in a world where everything that is becoming a service, right? And if, if you look at the physical world, you have got Uber, where instead of owning a car, you can rent the car, Airbnb. Uh, you have task rabbit. Instead of hiring a full-time worker, you can uh, have somebody to pay for specific tasks. Uh, you have got WeWork, where instead of uh, getting the whole office, you can uh, rent it out uh, based on your need. So you can see service model coming into the physical world as well. Now le let's take the same parallel in a services world, in a software world, right, or a digital world. So you got. Uh, these companies like Salesforce, Salesforce was the, uh, is, is the first company which made SaaS so popular. But then you have got Workday, AWS, GitHub, uh, these are all born in the cloud or SaaS companies, meaning they started their uh, 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 journey as a SaaS company. And then you get, get this uh, companies in the middle, which is uh, Adobe and Microsoft. Uh, they established their uh, credibility as a software company but then they saw the writing on the wall and they very quickly and not quickly I would say but over time they made a very successful transition into a SaaS model where you have Adobe Creative Cloud which is a fully deployed SaaS offering from Adobe, Microsoft Azure um, and I was part of Microsoft I know this journey was at least five to seven years old long where Microsoft kept, in, kept investing in a SaaS based platform and uh, now they are making uh, very good progress in terms of capturing market market share. So these are uh, examples of two companies which have made a very successful transition from a software centric uh, world to a SaaS centric world. And then you have got these companies in the middle, uh, in the bottom, right? Oracle, SAP, uh, Autodesk. Uh, these are companies uh, which are still in the process of trying to make that successful transition. And some of them are kind of succeeding, some of them are not, not so much. Okay, so that was just a background. Uh, now what I want to do is uh, talk, uh, talk a little bit about what are the benefits of a SaaS model from a customer uh, perspective and then take a similar view of what does SaaS mean from a vendor or software service provider point of view. And let's keep it interactive. I don't have a lot of content, so stop me, interject, ask questions, add your own inputs. Um, so, of course, the most uh, uh, straightforward benefit is that customers don't have to install the software on their own premises. It's available to them as a fully installed deployed software and that means uh, not just that customers save on hardware costs uh, and infrastructure, infrastructure costs but also they save a lot of time in time and uh, ops operations personnel needed to set up the software. Uh, the second benefit uh, is uh, from a uh, capex model, uh, SaaS allows customers to go into a opex model. Right? Instead of uh, investing, uh, buying money, uh, investing money in hardware and infrastructure, they can pay uh, on a op opex uh, way based on their usage. Uh, the third benefit is uh, vendor locking. So, 
what happens if uh, somebody buys a um, software from say Oracle and pay a, a five year license fee? Now they are locked into Oracle for five years. Uh, versus if you uh, subscribe to a, a SaaS offering and you decide to change, you can change it relatively more easily. So that, allow, that allows you to be more fluid and uh, reduces uh, vendor lock-in. Uh, the last one is, I would not say last, but on this slide, uh, in the SaaS model, customers have immediate access to uh, the latest features. Uh, so for example, in a, as opposed to a software model where uh, the service provider uh, provides a new version of the software, now you need to wait for the new software to be upgraded and that, that, that may be a huge time lag there. So those are some of the customer benef benefits. Now let's uh, flip the lens and see from a vendor perspective what does it mean? Why is SaaS uh, relevant? Um, of course, uh, the first uh, big benefit is the revenue model is predictable versus a software model where uh, you a vendor sells large uh, enterprise software and uh, the bookings happen uh, and if the, in a given quarter you are not able to book a few large customers, suddenly your revenue is much lower and that affects your, uh, um, uh, your revenue for that quarter. Uh, versus a SaaS model where uh, there is no, because, because the customers are paying on a recurring basis, you are, your, your revenue is a little bit more, uh, I would say a lot more predictable. Uh, the second benefit is a flip to the customer benefit is uh, you, now as a SaaS vendor you can release features much more frequently. Uh, think of a software world where you are selling software and how often would a enterprise uh, software vendor uh, sell a new, offer new versions of the software? What's your experience? You come from Cisco? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, yeah? Once a quarter. Once, once a quarter? Software? Yeah. Okay. Which, which company is it? Cisco. One, once a quarter is pretty good actually for software. Yeah, okay. Release, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's pretty. At really least the target is one per quarter. Okay. Four in a year, but we never get to that. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so once a quarter is very aggressive, I would say. In the software world, um, um, typically companies of uh, release new versions of software um, at most at a six months frequency, sometimes a year. Uh, a quarterly frequency is. Uh, You're super right. Awesome. I never released four in a year. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. That's a goal. Six months is impressive. Yeah. Six months is actually good. Yeah. On paper, it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's say that a company, uh, this company, uh, some company releases soft new versions of the software every six months. Now customers don't go and update that software on the next day. Right? Customers may take another six to twelve months to get the new version of the software. So it takes a lot more time for a, for a vendor to get its features to its customer's install base in a software model. Versus a SaaS model, you get the software, you release it, and typically many companies, they release software once every two weeks, and even, even some companies release it as soon as the code is done on a daily basis. Um, and once it is released, it is available to the entire customer install base. This is a huge benefit of a SaaS model for a vendor perspective as well, from a customer perspective as well. Uh, the next is uh, version metrics, right? If you have software and you sell, you offer different versions of the software, some customers uh, are still on the old versions. And uh, I've seen many cases where you have got a customer base with three different or four different versions of the software that are still in the customer base. And you are not able to retire any customer, any version. You have to still maintain all the backward compatibility. You want to release a new feature. You have to now test it on all the four different versions of the product. Um, it's very, very expensive. Um, SaaS model, there is no, no such issue, right? You have a single version of the SaaS uh, installation on the platform, you just push it and it, you're done. And faster customer acquisition. So if customers are able to uh, uh, get onboarded on the SaaS service much more, uh, much faster than a, a typical software installation, where uh, if you take inter enterprise software, it may take several months for a customer to install it, configure it and get it ready. Okay. So those are some of the benefits. Uh, now we are going to walk through a scenario. This is a hypothetical company, Innovo Inc. Uh, so this company, just to set the context, uh, has been uh, very successful in selling on-prem uh, ERP software for the last several years. They are one of the leaders. Uh, however, off late, uh, there are some new SaaS vendors that have come in the same space and uh, they are um, 
born in the cloud SaaS vendors, and they are and when Innovo is facing them in the market and facing very competitive challenges. Um, so what Innovo has come to the relation is that it needs to embrace the SaaS model uh, going forward uh, in the long term, otherwise it will have a big challenge in surviving in the market. So that's the background. Software company, long, long, time, so long, long time software company with a lot of customers using their on-prem software uh, has made a strategic, strategic decision to now move into a SaaS uh, model. And we'll walk through how they go about doing it, what are the challenges they uh, need to solve, and uh, where they land. Okay, so they want to move into SaaS, but how, they, how they, where would they start? Uh, so the obvious place to start is the product. The software product, now this need to, need to be re-architected so that it's now SaaS ready. And uh, here there are three uh, possible architectures that this uh, company can take. And the first one is the simplest relatively where you take the software and install it on a cloud hosted environment uh, but then install one instance of the software for each customer. So the only thing they do is take the same software that they have but now host and install and manage it for the customer in a vendor infrastructure. So that's uh, the first option. Uh, the second option is uh, uh, have separate database for each customer, but the app layer is common. So they have a, they re-architect the, re the app layer so that it's common for all the customers, uh, which is a multi-tenant app layer. Uh, and the ideal architecture is truly multi-tenant uh, architecture where both your app and database is multi-tenant, single instance of database and uh, your app, uh, which is accessible for by all your customers. So while one will get you started very quickly, uh, not very, but relatively quickly. It's a can of worms as you scale and uh, supportability, there are a lot of issues with that. Um, number three will take the most amount of time from a uh, platform perspective, but that's the model which uh, can scale uh, uh, over long term. So in this case, Innovo uh, decides to take uh, route number three because they are playing a long term game. So they re-architect the, re the product and it's now ready to go. Uh, now the next uh, in a SaaS model uh, Innovo has to uh, address is uh, hosting and operations. In a software model, the customer would buy your software, they would host it, uh, install it and host it on their own premise. Uh, the customer would operate the software. In a SaaS model, all those uh, activities need to be performed by the uh, vendor. So which means that uh, uh, now the Innovo has to invest in data centers, and install the software there. Uh, they need to now worry about 24 by 7 uptime because the customers are accessing the service across the globe. Um, they will need to be able to invest in zero downtime upgrades uh, so that when the new versions are updated, new features are released, uh, it's done without affecting the customers. Um, when there are issues in production, uh, this company would need to identify where the issues are which means that it needs to be much more enhanced uh, logging uh, and that uh, there is needs to be more uh, real-time monitoring. And uh, typically uh, this uh, DevOps also, there's a cultural shift beyond uh, taking care of those elements is uh, DevOps is a cultural shift that needs to happen, which is uh, uh, you have got a company which needs to develop software plus operate it and the development and operations team need to work very closely. Because if you see some of these uh, items like uh, zero downtime down updates or enhanced logging or real time monitoring, they all require uh, product and architecture changes. But these are all, the customer of these features are your ops team. So ops and the development team need to work very closely um, on these uh, elements. Scalability, right? so you have got the same instance of the platform, hosted platform, and as the customer base scales, uh, from 100 to 1000 to a million customers, the same platform should be able to scale horizontally. You can't, you can you, you cannot just add more uh, powerful CPUs and hardware. Right? It needs to be, you need to be able to scale the entire system horizontally by adding more nodes instead of getting bigger nodes. So we re-architected the software. We also invested in uh, hosting data centers, uh, change the culture from a development to a de DevOps uh, culture. Uh, but we have solved just a small portion of the transition to SaaS. There's a lot more that needs to happen for this company to become really a SaaS company. 
your, your platform is ready, it's available, uh, you have done a big marketing push, uh, uh, but uh, you're not seeing enough sales. Uh, custom, this, your sales team is still selling your software, legacy software. And the reason they are selling their legacy software is because they get a lot more, sales get commissioned based on uh, the volume of what they sell. And typically the software, uh, the price of software is much more than a subscription um, price. Right, so, and the sales are incentivized to sell software instead of subscription. That's one reason why this is happening. Uh, the second reason is that sales is comfortable selling software. They don't understand the SaaS uh, model themselves. Uh, so, uh, your SaaS is, uh, platform is sitting there while uh, sales is still selling the software. The second thing is uh, of the customers who have adopted your uh, SaaS uh, service, you are seeing more and more customer churn. Customers are subscribing to your SaaS service, but within a few months, they are dis discontinuing their service. And um, in a subscription world, the churn is a very big uh, factor in the success or failure of, I would say it's the number one factor in deciding whether your subscription or SaaS service will be successful or not. And you are seeing a very high uh, amount of customer churn. So to fix the uh, sales uh, incentive problem, uh, Innovo would uh, redesign uh, their sales incentives where uh, sales uh, team would get uh, uh, double, or many companies also double or triple the incentive for selling subscription versus uh, software. Uh, this, that's one uh, change that many companies do. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, from incentive perspective, in a software world, you sell a software and you are done, right? Sales uh, guy gets his commission and they are done. In a subscription, in a service or subscription world, that doesn't work. Because customers can subscribe, you can sell a service to a customer, but within a month they may decide to just discontinue the service. But the sales guy has got the commission, and that doesn't work. So the sales guy in now in a subscription world need to be not only incentivized to sell the stuff, but also to make sure that the customer is actually continue to use and uh, successful with the software, with the service. So the sales incentive needs to be is tied to the frequency of the customer's uh, adoption and renewals. And uh, for that, uh, you have uh, sales will typically work with a customer success manager team. And uh, also when they sell a software to a customer, they are looking to match the uh, match the what is sold to the customer's need. So there is a lot more onus on the sales team to make the right sale. Uh, the other thing is uh, customer churn, um, and typically uh, there is companies uh, spend heavily on spend, uh, investing more on the customer success manager team, uh, and the goal of this team is to work very proactively with the customer. Uh, even before uh, they have uh, started using the software to get them onboarded, resolve any issues, and they act as a, act as a bridge between the customer and the uh, product management team uh, to make sure that the right feedback from the customer gets ch channeled to the product team. And uh, on the churn, since you've talked about analytics, this is also a very interesting data where uh, now this uh, SaaS vendors are able to also need to invest heavily in getting the usage analytics from the customers and use that analytics data to figure out which customers are at risk of churn. Right? So for example, if you have customers who have bought the subscription service, but they have not started actively using it, they are clearly at risk of churn. Where you would engage your CSM team to figure out uh, are they uh, blocked because they are not able to get past some issue or some other issue factor. You would also find cases where you will see a customer have started using this using this uh, service, but the usage spiked, but then it's now started going down. Now that's again a red flag of why the usage is going down. Are they evaluating a competing comp uh, service? Uh, right. So that's again a area where you can engage your CSM team proactively, armed with this analytics data to go and uh, address that customer. So we took care of a lot of things. I think we are done. We should be in a good spot. We have made a transition from a software to a service world, right? We reacted to the product. We invested in hosting. We changed the culture to a DevOps culture. We realigned the sales incentives, invested in CSMs. We did a bunch of stuff. Uh, we should be mostly done by now from a transition perspective. What do you think? Thank you.
No? If we, if we were done, we wouldn't be asking you <laughs> this question. <laughs> There's a lot, right? Uh, so, okay, what else, what, what, is, what else do you think could be missing? Is it generating the right amount of revenue uh, where you stand in the competition? You made the transition, but how well are you doing in the market? Right. Uh, are you making enough uh, revenue from the subscription yeah. service? And I would suppose probably not a lot because it's still a new service. Um, you have few customers, not a lot. Uh, most of your customers are still uh, using your software. So yeah, while you are getting revenue from your software, the revenue from your uh, SaaS service is probably right now less. So while the revenue is less, how much are you really burning in terms of all this hosting, DevOps? You are burning a lot of money. You are burning a lot of money. You are setting. You are, in, you are hiring new people who are uh, who can do that stuff. You are investing in all the infrastructure, DevOps infrastructure. You are investing in data centers. These are huge capital expenses. Yeah. While your revenue has gone up, your cost structure has gone up like anything. Your revenue. You have not seen any net new revenue really by now. So this company uh, saw the the next quarterly report that the revenue actually dipped. It not just not just the cost structure went up because of the investment in infrastructure and all the revenue dipped and everyone is uh, the stock price of course went down and everyone is wondering why did the revenue dip um, we thought that investing in SaaS and all is going to take us to a new level and our revenue will increase we'll get new customers and yes we have gotten new customers why is the revenue dipped this is a pretty big, 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 uh, pretty comment. And yes, if this, if this company had enough money, they would balance. It, meaning, they would support both software and uh, service. Uh, they have limited budget. It's a very challenging situation, and this is not unique. It's, I have seen the same uh, uh, situation in Connecticut Informatica, where we are doing the same thing. And uh, here, the answer here, part of the answer is uh, hybrid. So you provide a path, as you said, uh, for customers to move from software to a SaaS model, but not move entirely but move incrementally. You have got a software, but you have got a SaaS service, and your software customers can start consuming parts of the uh, SaaS service incrementally, and over time they can move to the uh, SaaS service. So, which means that you need to, have, first of all, you need to have a product and technical bridge between the software and the SaaS so that they can work together. So, it's a product and uh, product investment need to happen there so that the experience is seamless. And here I'll give an example of uh, VMware, right? So, VMware has, uh, this on-prem VMware virtual stack. Uh, and then uh, they launched uh, the VMware cloud on AWS, uh, right? which is uh, now you can, you have, anybody heard of that offering? Yeah, yeah, it, was, it was quite recent actually. Yeah, it was recent, yeah. it was recent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I was part of the team in VMware. I was at VMware then. So I'm using that example. So now this, the VMware cloud on AWS allows customers, uh, in this case VMware customers, to get access to VMware software, but instead of installing, installing it on their own prem, they can get it as a service from AWS. Okay. And then uh, there's a single management plane. So now think of a customer who has VMware software on prem. Now they got some uh, service from AWS. Um, on the, now, because both are, both are VMware software, at the end of the day, there is single management plane that the customer can use. Uh, to operate between the two uh, pieces, which is an example of a hybrid experience. In Formatica as well, we are doing something similar. I won't go into the details, but we have a on-prem software, but now this iPaaS, which is our cloud-based uh, system, now customers who are on software world in uh, Informatica software can start consuming functionality in the cloud, uh, some functionality which is in the cloud. And what Informatica is doing is uh, many of the latest features, the new features are cloud-first only, where customers are being forced I would not say forced, they're coerced, software customers have been coerced to use the cloud because the new features, if you want new features, you uh, get it from cloud. So, well, uh, so this company did uh, make those changes. They invested in hybrid and finally they started to see some success.